remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. America's evil genius, Travis Cook, back with you once again. And earlier this week, up in Madison, Wisconsin, there was a taxpayer-funded conference on the concept of white privilege. That's right, a conference about white privilege that was funded in part by taxpayer dollars. Now, there's no word if in the future we will be funding upcoming conferences on things like climate change, Santa Claus, the Tooth Fairy, the Easter Bunny, or any other fictional concepts, but at least this week, we did have a taxpayer-funded con conference on the fictional concept of white privilege. Yes, you heard that right. I told you that white privilege is a fictional concept. It does not exist. Now, some of you are, are, are steaming right now at hearing me say that. Allow me to explain. There are many out there who look at the poverty and the crime that currently exist within certain minority communities and they automatically blame such things on race. They say it's a function of the inherent racism of society uh, that those economic issues ex exist or that the crime exists or so forth. But an actual look at the numbers and the reality of the situation will tell you a far different story. You know, many times when these uh, folks who, who claim institutional racism and white privilege and and, and use that as an explanation for the fact that some people in society are doing better than others, so many times they will pick apart certain very high-level statistics to tell that story. One of the statistics you'll often hear those liberals say, and those who believe in white privilege, what you'll hear them talk about oftentimes, is that they will tell you that blacks are turned down for mortgage loans from a bank at twice the rate of whites. They will always point to that statistic, and it is true. If you look back in the 2000s and you look at the numbers, wherever you want to find them, you will indeed see that blacks are turned down for mortgages at roughly twice the rate that whites are. Now, many people see that and as a knee-jerk reaction automatically say, that's racist. How racist can you be that those evil bankers sit up there in their office and they say, oh, that, that's a black man. We're not, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna give him a loan. We're gonna give that white man a loan. Except, does it really happen that way? Is it really a function of racism? You see, there's another part of that statistic that they usually don't tell you about. While it is true that blacks are turned down for mortgages at twice the rate of whites, it is also true that whites are turned down for mortgages at twice the rates of Asian Americans. Hmm? What? So does this mean that we need to have taxpayer-funded conferences on the scourge of Asian American privilege? No. Maybe it means there's something far less egregious than race that's involved in these differences. You see, all these cries of racism, all these cries of racial bias, overlook the fact that many of the factors that go into a bank's decision whether or not to grant a loan to whomever, are also different among different races in, in those large number of people within races. For example, the average credit rating of blacks as a whole is also lower than the average credit rating for whites. Okay, well, that kind of makes sense then. If the credit ratings are lower, and that's a pretty big factor, then it would stand to reason that the... Uh, Mortgage approvals are lower for blacks too. And, and, and what does a credit rating measure? A credit rating measures behavior. It doesn't measure your race. It's a somewhat objective set of numbers that tells you, here's how this person pays their bills, here's how they save, here's how they go past due. And it just so happens that right now, for whatever reason, more of that is happening among blacks than whites. But likewise, credit ratings for Asian Americans as a whole, the average credit rating for Asians is higher than that of whites. So it's really not race, it's behavior. You're seeing objective numbers that also look different among these cultures. Now think of that for a second. Credit ratings analyze and quantify behavior. So then what does that mean for this question? And you know what, this is also backed up 
by the fact that black-owned banks also turned down black applicants at a higher rate than white, than white applicants. Likewise, white-owned banks also turned down white applicants at a higher rate than Asian American applicants. You see what's happening here? The, the whole racial bias uh, discussion, the racial bias idea tends to fall apart when you actually look at the numbers, when you actually look at the components that comprise whether or not a loan is approved. It's behavior, not race. And it so happens that for whatever reason, at this point in time, more people within the black community appear to be behaving financially irres irresponsibly compared to the number of whites that are. And in turn, the number of whites who are behaving financially irresponsibly is higher than that of the number of Asian Americans who are behaving financially irresponsibly. Maybe instead of claiming race or, or, or complaining about that, maybe we all should be looking at what some of these Asian Americans are doing in terms of their finances and learning a little bit from them. Maybe we all would be better off doing that. They're clearly doing something right. But again, it's not a function of race. It's a number of, it's a function instead of how many people within those racial groups are behaving responsibly versus irresponsibly. It's not about race, it's about individual behavior. It's about the type of culture that individual people choose to accept, choose to be a part of, choose to, choose to use the basis for their lives. You see, people talk about white culture and black culture. I don't think such things exist. There is no such thing as a white culture. You can take a white man from Texas, let's say, and stand him next to a white man from California, and you will see two very clearly different cultural models on display. Likewise, just as not all whites behave the same way, not all whites have the same culture, not all blacks have the same culture either. You could take an African American who was raised in a affluent area to, to professional parents, and you're far less likely to see the same type of misbehavior and crimes and financial irresponsibility out of that person as they grow older as you do out of people who are raised in the ghetto. Likewise, there are white folks raised in the ghetto. There's not a lot of them, but there's some. And you see them most often demonstrate the same pathology that you see out of the blacks that grow up there. So it's clearly not a race thing. It's a cultural thing. It's the acceptance of the ghetto culture whomever accepts it, that it has negative influences on their future success. Now, what about crime? Because that's the other area that, that people talk about uh, being such a, such a red flag for racism. And they'll always tell you, you know, blacks are, blacks are jailed, blacks are incarcerated at a far higher rate than whites, and that's got to be racist. Well, there's some numbers that kind of shoot that idea in the foot. After all, blacks are only 13% of the population, judging by the last census, but yet 53% of all criminal homicides are committed by blacks. Well, gee, if 13% of the population is committing over half of the homicides, you might assume that more people from that particular ethnic group end up in jail than others. Makes sense, after all, they're committing more of the crimes right now. Doesn't mean that'll be the case 20 years from now or 40 years from now, who knows? Who knows who will be committing the crimes in? But as it stands today, that's how the numbers work out. Now, for the higher incarceration rates of African Americans to be a problem, to be a legitimate problem that needs to be solved, you would have to be able to demonstrate that there is a large amount of homicides committed by whites that never get caught or convicted. I'm not saying there's not any, I'm sure there's some, but is it such a huge amount that, you know, that, that there's equal committing of crimes among the races, but yet one, one race is jailed more than the others? No, absolutely not. I mean, think about it. If as many whites committed homicides as blacks right now, I think we whites would notice that people around us were disappearing and not ever being seen again. That's not the case. Now that's not a slam on African Americans, that's a slam on the culture that some African Americans are choosing to take part in. A culture which does not look down upon crime the way that other cultures do. A culture that does not, that has not to this point assimilated into American culture the way other cultures have, the way Asians have, for example. The way I, the Irish did, the Germans did, years ago. Now, 
One other little line of thinking we get from these liberals sometimes is that the poverty and the crime in the African American community is just a continuation of the scourge of slavery. That there's this unbroken line from the time of slavery to today of black poverty and and, and black uh, the black family breaking down and and black crime, but actually that's not the case. That line very much is broken. You see, what your history books probably don't tell you is that there was a period in American history where blacks as a whole were really starting to make some great inroads in terms of economics, in terms of salary, in terms of wealth, in terms of their families. And that time period is not particularly recent. That time period actually happened roughly before the 1960s. Yes, even during the time of Jim Crow, that happened. For example, take these following statistics into account. Poverty among black families was 87% in 1940, but by 1960 that had reduced to 47%. It cut almost in half. Incomes of blacks relative to whites doubled between 1936 and 1939. The rise of blacks in professional and other high-level occupations was greater in the five years preceding the Civil Rights Act of 1964 than it was in the five years afterwards. In 1940, 86% of black children were born inside marriage. An illegitimacy rate was about 15%. By 2008, only 31% were born inside marriage and the illegitimacy rate was near 70%. Now, what does all that mean? That, that tells you that there were positives happening in the, in the black community prior to the 1960s, that a lot of the crime, the pathology, the economic destitution you see is a relatively recent development, roughly around the time that the liberals got involved and said, oh, we need government to help you out with everything. You don't need to assimilate into society. And you know, you, you can go have kids outside of marriage and we'll pay for them and all of those things, the so-called great society. So again, it is behavior of individual people within a race being the most effective component for the crime and, and poverty and destitution and so forth, much more so than any sort of racial bias. In fact, if you're still unconvinced that behavior and responsible behavior is the key, check this out. Did you know that the poverty rate among married African Americans is in the single digits? That's right. For all the talk you hear about African American poverty and the destitution of our inner cities and how, how a black man and a black woman just doesn't have a chance in this society, yet the poverty rate among married African Americans is presently in single digits, and it has been since the 1980s. Hmm. So if you're responsible, and you don't have kids out of wedlock, you get your education, you don't run around committing crimes, you don't end up in jail, you got a pretty good shot, no matter who you are. Now finally, the most egregious in my mind, the most egregious argument made by those who believe in the uh, believe in the fictional concept of white privilege is the idea that because of slavery in the case of blacks, or because of let's say the westward expansion in the case of American Indians, for example, uh, because of those things that that the people who are living today who are descendants of those who went through such things are entitled to some sort of consideration by those of us who are alive today. Does that really make sense? From where I sit, it doesn't. Because the dirty little secret is that for all, for, for all the, the negatives about slavery, and no one's saying slavery is a good thing, for all the negatives about slavery, for all the negatives of what Amer American Indians went through in the 1800s, or whatever group you want to name, they'll, they'll, they'll find a group somewhere and claim that Europeans wronged them at some point 200, 300, 1,000 years ago, and claim that they need... Uh, some sort of consideration from European Americans, as though that's really a term, uh, because of that. For all of that, people don't realize or don't stop to think that the descendants of those people that were supposedly wronged are living a much better life today than they would have if those incidents had never happened. For example, an African American living in 2014 in America, 
is living a far better life, has a much higher standard of living than they would have had their descendants not had their forefathers not come over here and had they been born in Africa. You can look at the standard of living for the typical African nation and see that it pales in comparison to ours. Now that's not saying slavery is a good thing that doesn't justify it, but what it's saying is that the end result of that bad thing does have benefits for those who are four and five generations removed. Likewise for the American Indians, for all the horrible things we put them through, those who are alive today live in a wonderful society with education at their fingertips, with all kinds of opportunities that they never would have been able to live in had the American Indians been left alone. See, a lot of people have trouble reconciling all that. They, 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 want, they want to think that because bad things happened to someone 200 years ago, that it just leads in, an un, it leads in a continuous line through to today, but it doesn't make sense. You see, what any sociologist or anthropologist or academic will tell you is that cultures always benefit from interacting with more advanced cultures. Okay, and there's not a lot of disagreement on that, that if you're a culture that might have been geographically isolated or just not real technologically advanced back in history, that any time you would interact with a more advanced culture, you would gain the benefit of that. You'd learn how to do new things, you'd gain new skills, and so forth. All right? That's something there's practically universal agreement on, right? What those academics and sociologists and anthropologists often do not tell you is that in world history, the way that such interactions happen is not through a bunch of people getting together, gathering around a campfire and singing Kumbaya. Instead, cultural interaction most often happens through one culture enslaving another, through one culture invading another, through one culture conquering another. It's not pretty. And it's not just here in America. This has pretty much happened over the entire world. You know, when the Romans invaded Western Europe way back in the old days, was it not true that as bad as that was, Western Europeans for hundreds of years afterwards were far more advanced than those cultures around them? Yes, because they were exposed to the Romans. As much of a ransacking as it was, their descendants were the beneficiaries of it. You see, cultural interaction, while it's positive in the long run, is often very dirty and difficult. It's very difficult. That's the reality of human nature. So for all that are complaining about what might have happened 150 years ago, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, Take a moment and stop and look about how those descendants of those people are living today. Now, if you've got a problem with what happened 200 years ago, I can understand that. But you need to understand that there's no way to bring about justice for that because those who engage in the activities 200, 300, however many years ago are all dead. You can't bring them to justice. They're already dead. Likewise, those who were victimized 200, 300, however many years ago, they're all dead too. So they can't attain justice on this earth. Meanwhile, those of us who might be descendants of those engaging in such activities, we have not benefited from them. Those who have descended from those who were victimized way back when have not been victimized today. In fact, generally speaking, they have benefited. So we need to look at history as just that. We don't need to look at it as a way of continuing cultural grievances that have long been settled. So white privilege, what privilege? Most whites, believe it or not, are only two, three, maybe four generations removed from abject poverty themselves. We're, we're, not, we're not a race of old money, believe it or not. Very few of us are anyway. We've come up through the same struggles everybody else has. Most of us have. So instead of trying to claim that it's racism that's holding you down, why don't you instead look at the behaviors of those who have been successful, whomever they are, whether they're white, whether they're Asian, whether, whether they're black, because there are certainly successful black people, successful people of every race and creed. Why not look to them and realize that you individually do not have a responsibility to your race, whatever that race may be. If you're a black man, you don't, do not have a responsibility to other blacks. I, as a white person, have no responsibility to other whites. I couldn't care less what happens to them. Instead, you have a responsibility to you.
You don't have to eradicate poverty within your community. You simply have to eradicate poverty within your own household, within your own family. That's all your responsibility is. And as more of us believe that way and look out for ourselves instead of some vague collective that we never chose to be a part of to begin with, that's when so much of the racial animus in this nation will cease to exist. And that's when so much of the economic despair that we see will cease to exist as well because we'll all finally start looking out for ourselves individually not as a race not as a group of people not as a community that's it for this week this is america's evil genius we will see you next time